morning and welcome to another Fast Tracks webinar. This is a weekly event we do every Friday at 9 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Eastern, where we go over various topics of the Fast Track software. You can see a list of all these events if you go to our website, ftx.com. Use the FTX Lifeline tab at the top of the screen. Navigate to the webinar button. Choose that, and that will a listing of all of our webinars that you can register for, as well as all the webinars you can view previous recordings. You can also choose the subscribe to, no to get notified link, and that will let you sign up for the newsletter, which will notify you of upcoming webinars. This week, we're going to be talking about tenders, creating the tender button, and then credit card integration settings, as well as the negative check file. So first and foremost, let's go into director, and we're going to go to the maintenance tab, and we're going to choose the tender button. And this will bring up a list of all of our tenders. Now, tenders are, of course, forms of payments. There's going to be a predetermined amount of tenders already in the, uh, the system where itself when you first get it, and those generally need to be left alone. Those are hard-coded values. You can, of course, add tenders as you need them, but for the most part, the ones that are pre-built in are exactly what you need. Now, this tender type, that's an important number. That has to be a unique numerical number, and that's actually programmed to be a specific type of tender. Now, I have a list of those numbers here that you can see on my screen in this notepad file. And like I said, these are hard-coded values, so you don't ever need to change these values. If you have any questions on what these values should be, if you've deleted those, you can always contact our support team, and we can actually reprogram those back in for you. Now, looking at these tenders, of course, there's that tender type field we just talked about. You have the description itself. You have an account code. And this account code will be used if you're utilizing an accounting export, such as Great Plains, QuickBooks. If you need that accounting code value reversed, you would choose this checkbox for export reversed. What that does is on your accounting export, if it's a negative value, such as like a uh, loyalty redemption, if you choose this export reversed, it will actually flip that negative value to where it's a positive value on the accounting export file. You have a min sell amount. That is going to be the minimum dollar amount that that tender can be used, such as say you have that set for $2. That means that that sell amount, if you're using this tender, has to be at least $2. You have a max and drawer value. You have a max change value, which that will, of course, be how much change can you give of this tender. You have a, rec a recon bucket, which is a reconciliation bucket. Now, this will be used on grouping tenders together, and that's specifically used for reporting and uh, your shift and daily reconciliations. An example of how these are grouped together are like our Visa and our MasterCard. And our American Express, notice those are all that recon bucket of credit cards. You're grouping all those together. So whenever you're doing a reconciliation, you'll have the summed value of all your credit card sales in that, that one bucket. You have the over-tendering option. Now, if this is enabled, that allows you to over-tender, meaning that if you have, let's say, a $5.50 transaction, the customer can pay $6.00 that tender. So for cash, of course, you'd want to have that option. They can pay over the amount and then you give them change back. Well, safe drops, that'll of course allow let you allow safe drops for that tender. Require tender amount. This is really a preference if you want that turned on or not. What it's going to do is it's going to require the cashier to enter a tender amount on the subtotal screen. Let's, let me show you an example of how that functions. So I've got cash that's actually turned on right now. So I'm going to log into my point of sale here. And I'm going to ring up an item real fast. So I've got that setting turned on. That means I just can't come to the screen and choose the cash button. I'm going to get an error message. It tells me I require a tender amount. So that means I actually have to enter in 704 or some numerical value and then press the cash button. If I have that turned off, it does not require 
me to enter in a value, I can press the cash button and it will automatically assume that the customer is paying exact change. Just to show you an example of that, there's my subtotal. I'm just going to press the cash button and it just assumes the customer is paying exact change, the, the exact subtotal balance, no changes to you. And then finally, there's the open cash drawer. And it does exactly that. Whenever you use that tender, it's going to pop the cash drawer open. If you don't want it to pop open, just choose that checkbox and make sure that it's not checked. Now, building a tender button, you of course have to have the permission to have the POS button editor on your cashier login. So to do that, I'm just going to go to my actions, settings, and the POS button editor. And I'm going to go to my subtotal panel because that's where all my tenders actually are. And I'm going to choose a blank button. I'm going to edit that button. And then I'm going to go to the button type of tender. And then here I can choose the button size. I can give it a caption. I can choose a color, a background, a glyph. Uh, for more detail on the actual button editing functionality, um, you can watch the POS button editor webinar, and that goes into all the details of what all these options actually are. Now, specifically for the tender one, we want to make sure we choose the correct tender type. Is it a cash? Is it check? Is it a credit card, debit card, gift card? You want to make sure that's selected properly. And then you choose your tender ID. So if I wanted to use just a cash button, I can choose the cash tender type, I'll choose the tender ID, I'll break up this drop down here and I'll choose the cash. And that allows me to create a cash button. You then choose save and then update and that would actually save that button. I've already got that button in place. I'm going to go ahead and cancel this. So that covers the basics of building a new tender button. And like I said, if you need assistance on the entire button creation process, there's a full webinar on nothing but creating buttons and panels. I'd highly suggest you watch that. So next, we're going to look at the negative check file. And the negative check file is going to be used if you actually take paper checks. And it will basically keep a listing of customers that you accept checks from. Um, there's two options. There's the accept checks from this customer. And there is the unchecked version where you don't accept the checks from that customer. And it does exactly that. If you have that checkbox set, it's going to allow the system to accept checks from this customer key, which is generally a driver's license number. And then if that's unchecked, when you key in that driver's license number, it's not going to accept that value from the customer. Now, once you have the, the customers actually programmed into the system, you have to enable the setting on the POS. And to do that, you have to have a login that is, has permission to edit the settings. I do, so I'm going to go to my settings here, my settings button there, and then I'm going to go to the other settings. Now, there's a verify checks option. And really, if you're utilizing that checkbox, it doesn't matter what you have selected when it comes to positive or negative. It's going to use what that checkbox has. If you don't want to verify checks, just set that to none and it totally ignores that negative check file. But if you want to utilize that, make sure you have something other than none set. So an example of how this will work is let me ring up an item here and I'll, we will how that function works. So I'm going to look at John Doe here. And I can see that this driver's license, this customer key is just one, two, three, four, five, six. So whenever I'm doing the paper check button, I'm going to enter in that check number. Just put a random number there, the actual check number itself. The key I want to use is the check account info. I'm going to put in his driver's license number or whatever key that I'm using and then choose OK, and it accepts the sale properly. Now, if I do the same thing, if I use Jane Doe, and that account is marked to not accept checks from, I'm going to get a message saying that I can't accept check from Jane. Now, Jane's is 654321, so I'll enter that in. 
choose OK, and then notice I get an account on hold. I can't do that because that checkbox to accept checks from this customer is not checked. Now, I can have a manager override and allow the manager to override that. Um, in this case, I'm logged in as a manager, so I can just simply choose that and it continues on with the transaction. But if I don't have a manager override code, then I can't accept that form of payment. So I'd actually have to cancel out of that screen and then use cash or credit or gift card, whatever forms of payment you would accept other than check. So when it comes to the negative check file itself, all that really matters that you have filled in would be the customer key, that checkbox to accept checks from this customer, check it to accept checks for it, that customer, uncheck it to make sure that you don't accept checks, and then the customer name. All this other information, it's great if you key it in, but the system actually doesn't require you to have that. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at will be credit card integration. And this is a pretty big topic on that we deal with quite a bit. We accept two integration methods with credit cards. There's the kind of universal one uh, that is through DataCap NetiPay, and there is a direct Heartland integration utilizing HeartSip. Now, the most common one by far is the DataCap NetiPay, and that's kind of a processor agnostic. Anybody can use that. To get to that, just to get information on it, you have to go to datacapsystems.com, and that'll be the DataCap website. And what DataCap software does is it's kind of the middleman in between the FastTrax POS software and the credit card merchant services. So anytime there's a credit card swiped on the pin pad that's tied to the POS, that DataCap software will handle the authorization and payment to the processor and then get the response from the processor and send that back to fast tracks. So to see what processors and what pin pads are compatible with DataCap NetiPay, simply on their website, go to the Solutions tab. Once this page loads, you'll scroll down just a bit to the compatible devices. That'll load up a new page. And this page here will have a listing of all the compatible pin pads that can be used with DataCap NetiPay. And you can't just use any pin pad. You have to use a pin pad that's actually certified with their software. Um, there's a whole list of pin pads here. And just for an example, let's say I wanted to use the Ingenico IPP320. I would just simply choose that. That will load up the IPP320 page. That will tell you where you can purchase that pin pad. That will tell you what processors are actually compatible with the IPP320 as well as DataCap. And then below that, it'll have like the NetiPay hosted secure ID, which is what's required for the pin pad to have loaded, as well as the specific processor IDs. And of course, if you're utilizing, say, Heartland with IPP320, then you have to have the correct load on that pin pad. So if you purchase that, make sure that you're purchasing the proper load for your processor, for your merchant services. Now, the software that runs is called NetiPay. And let's go back to their main page. And if you're utilizing integrated card processing through NetiPay, uh, you would schedule a time with Fast Track support, and we will um, walk you through and install this with you. The software that's required, you get on the NetiPay site, datacapsystem.com, their homepage. You choose the download tab and then they get started on this page. And we use the NetiPay 5.0. Now, if you purchase your license, that's going to be a separate software license that uh, DataCap charges for. Uh, there's two options. There's the purchased and there's the rental. And depending on what method you're utilizing, you have to choose the correct download. You can't just use one universal installer. So, for example, if I wanted to use, let's say, um, First Data Rapid Connect, and I, want, I, have, I actually have a purchased license, I would come to this page, I would use the Purchase tab, and I would choose the FDMS Rapid Connect host. I would choose that, and that would come into the required software. 
Now, we actually require you to install the DSI PDCX as well as the DSI EMV US. Those are required for every system that's utilizing integrated card processing. Now, the main register is going to run what's called the host software. And that's going to be a bit lower. That's going to be this software here, and that's step three. And there's two options. You can download the processor specific host software by using this download link here. Or you could utilize the better method, which is the NetiPay 5 director. And what that does is that is a universal installer that will automatically grab merchant settings, um, especially in update if they change or update any kind of software automatically. That's the preferred method. That's the newer method. Now, like I said, anytime you're having a, a credit card installation in place, please contact our support team and we'll help you walk walk you through this step-by-step uh, step and make sure you're up and running and getting testing and verification done. Now, for the pin pad drivers, let's go back to the download page. That's just the software that handles the pin pad to computer communication as well as the communication to the merchant services and fast tracks. There's also the, the actual pin pad drivers themselves. So you choose that device drivers here, and then you would choose what type of pin pad you have. Is it a Verifone? Is it a Genico? Is it an Equinox? And then, of course, install the, that specific software as well. Now we're going to go into the actual POS configuration. So, of course, you have to have a login that has access to the settings, and I do. So I'm going to go to my Actions, Settings, Settings here, and there's going to be a CC tab for credit cards. Now, there's the data cap option, which is, like I said, the most common. And all this information here will be provided to you on what's called a VAR sheet from your merchant services. So whether it's utilizing tokenization, your merchant ID, um, the terminal ID, that type of stuff, that's going to be provided to you that will help you fill in from your merchant services. The device itself, that'll be a drop down that you can populate. Um, and you would just choose, of course, the, the exact pin pad that you have with the exact processor. Then the pin pad is going to be operating on a virtual port. So we'll, you'd put in that virtual port number, and that can always be found in the device manager. If there's a second pin pad device being used, for like such as a drive through, you would choose that checkbox, and that would allow you to choose a second device so the system can, it can choose which device is being utilized per transaction. Um, and then after you've got these settings in place, you would choose the download data cap params. And that's going to download the, the actual parameters from the settings we have input here to the pin pad itself. Essentially loading in that merchant ID and that terminal ID and if it's using tokenization or not. Now for the primary server field, on register one, the main register, essentially where the NetiPay software is going to be running, that's going to be localhost or 127.0.0.1. That basically tells the software it's looking to itself, the local machine. On any additional registers, on secondary machines, you would point to wherever that software is running. So if you're on a register two and that software is running on register one, you'd put in register one's local IP address. So 192.168.1. Whatever your subnet and your IP address is for your register one. That would tell the secondary machine to look to register one for any kind of transactions and any kind of parameter downloads. Now below that, you have all the options for printing on your secondary credit card receipts. This essentially allows you to shorten the um, secondary receipts to say paper. There's also the option to require a minimum sale amount of a specific dollar amount. That means that if you're using credit cards and you put in five here, it's going to require a minimum sale of $5 in order to use a credit card. Um, you have the option to require a manager override for manual entry amounts. So that's going to be if you're not swapping a credit card, if you're actually using a manual card entry, then you can have it forced a manager override to use that. 
then you have the disallow partial authorizations. And what that is, is let's say you have a debit card. The customer comes in with a debit card and they have a $100 transaction and they have $50 on their debit account. If you have that, that disallow partial authorizations checked, then it's not going to automatically take $50 from their, their checking account and then say the balance due is now $50. It just won't take that period and it'll say there's not enough funds on the card. You then have the option to apply a credit card fee and that can be a flat amount or a percentage. You put in that fee amount and then the department for that fee that you want to utilize. And of course, that would require you to create a brand new department. Now, this pre-authorizations tab, that is for the other integration we have, which is for Heartland HeartSip. Now, this, you would, of course, choose the pin pad type. You would choose the mode, which is going to be IP, and you would put in that pin pad's IP address. And this is not, there's no software running on the register for this. Software heart zip is actually loaded into the pin pad itself, so that pin pad is plugged up to your router through an internet connection, and it has this on IP address. And you'd put in that IP address of that particular pin pad, you put in the port number, and then um, a timeout period. That would all be provided by your merchant services. And essentially, each register will look to that IP address every time there's a transaction. Now, this also enables the pre-authorizations. And you can choose a pre-authorization amount. And then you can also add a tip when closing that transaction. That could be a flat dollar amount or a percentage. Just make sure that you have a tip department as well. because Just like your fee department, you have to have a tip department. So that's the two methods of credit card integration. Um, building a button for that is essentially the same as building one for your other tenders, in your button editor. When building a credit card button, you would want to make sure, let's go to the one that I've actually already got here, that your tender type is credit card. That, that way, the system will actually look to your credit card settings and then talk to that pin pad. If you have it set for a MISC tender, which a lot of times if you don't do credit card integration, that's what it would be set for for credit cards, it does not talk to the pin pad. So that's the main difference in a non-integrated versus an integrated card processing on the POS, that tender button for your credit cards. Non-integrated would be a MISC tender, and then the credit card type would be for the actual integrated credit card tender. All right, so I hope everybody learned something today. Once again, these events are every Friday at 9 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Eastern. You can see a list of these webinars at our website, goftx.com. Choose the FTX Lifeline tab, and then go to the webinars button. We'll show you a list of all of our upcoming webinars as well as our previously recorded webinars. And you can sign up for the news, to be notified of any kind of new upcoming webinars. Thank you. Have a great weekend.